Welcome back, clients and guests. My name is Jason Saro, and I'm a licensed professional counselor located in Connecticut. My videos are designed to educate and empower you to make informed decisions about your mental health. Please like the video, subscribe, and pass this along to friends and family if you think it will help them in some way. I am pleased to introduce to you Ken Bell. For many in the Rhode Island area, Ken Bell needs no introduction as he served over 30 years as a sportscaster for Channel 10 and the sports anchor for Channel 6. He has made several guest appearances on radio shows over the years and currently serves as a deacon at Christ Church in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. I'm truly grateful Ken is able to speak with me today as he will talk about the importance of kindness, generosity, and faith. It's his strong faith that has guided him throughout his life and he was kind enough to share his insights on how to make our lives more loving, meaningful, and have purpose. Ken is the father of two adult children and has five beautiful grandchildren. He has endless enthusiasm and positivity when he engages with them and is incredibly generous and selfless with his time and attention. I hope you enjoy our talk today and take away a positive message regarding the faith in your life. Without further ado, Ken Bell. Ken, I want to thank you so much for being here. When I asked you to, if you would be willing to join me, and you had so much grace in your answer, and you were like, absolutely, I want to be part of that, and I, I um, want to help you in any way. Um, I was just so grateful for you and your generosity. And I know that you have so much to offer for our community, uh, especially in a time like this today. And a lot of people are down, not feeling hopeful, even with the vaccine coming out, there's still chaos around, right. still a lot of uncertainty. And I know with you, uh, there is a lot of hope and faith. And your messages to me over the years have sunk in and they've been a big part of my life. And they have come out to others that I have helped. So I wanna thank you for everything. I appreciate that and I thank you for your position because we need we need professional care for people who are, who are struggling. And it's hard to navigate life right now with everything that's going on. And uh, even before the pandemic, life is hard, the world's on edge. You add the pandemic into that, you have a lot of people struggling. So we need people who care about others. And that's what I appreciate about the job that you have. Thank you. Some of the words that, uh, so I did a little digging on you uh -oh. a little bit, <laughs> and some of the words that people use to describe you, uh, some of some videos and some people that you know, and they call you kind. Uh, this one was interesting, a perennial optimist, mm. generous, and uh, you, you do, your message is to do your best with what you have. Uh, mm. So those are some of the things that that people have told you. I could, I could write a book about uh, what I think about you, but when you, when you hear those, those descriptions of you, what comes to mind for you? I think that what comes to mind is what I hope to be. I hope to be those things, and I, uh, for some reason, those are woven into my personality, and so I find them uh, building on my strength mm -hmm. to be able to uh, encourage people. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like encouraging others really energizes me. It's the thing that really makes me tick. And um, if I can offer a, a word of kindness to someone, if I can encourage somebody during the day, that really encourages me. That's where I live. Were there some values that were instilled in you at an early age? I was thankful to grow up in a Christian household. Both my parents were, were Christians. But the interesting thing, Jay, is that my dad was an Adventist, which is a little fundamental, mm -hmm. and my mother was a Methodist, which was a lot freer. And so I had these two influences in the house, and I was uh, able to choose where I wanted to go, and I became a, a Methodist because I thought they were having more fun at the time. I was growing up, you know, I was a kid. <laughs> but but the, the two of them together, even though there, there, were some, there was some friction and so forth, um, Adventists, they uh, practice on Saturdays, keep the Sabbath. Sundays was for the Methodist church. And yeah. so uh, there were some sacrifices to be made. Um, my brother was a football player and a, and a good track performer, and my dad would not go to his 
events on a Saturday. So we had trouble, we had struggle, struggle with that. But basically what I wanna say is that they provided a foundation for me at that time that has lasted all my life. So whatever the, the imperfection of how that was lived out yeah. and what we saw in the family, that basic grounding yeah. has served me all my life. Yeah. What can you recall as, as you know, maybe a, a very impressionable um, characteristic or, or, or trait or quality that your, either your mom or dad really instilled in you? The, um, the value of family was, was very important. I had a grandmother yeah. who I never saw angry my entire life. And uh, she was with me much of my life until I was uh, into college and beyond college. And she just had, so I, I tell a story about her. The family would go into a store and she would sit on a bench waiting for us to come out. And we would come out and she would just be talking like crazy to the person next to her, a total stranger. Mm -hmm. They'd be laughing and sharing stories. And she never met a stranger. Mm -hmm. She loved life. Mm -hmm. And on her tombstone, it says, if you love life, it will love you back. And her whole, her whole point was she just loved talking mm -hmm. with people and loved other people, yeah. and that love came back to her. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about um, loving life, and life will love you back. Um, did you ever question that for yourself? Did you, was there ever a point where that, you know, that, that philosophy really was being challenged? Absolutely. Um, there was a couple of times, first of all, was um, in, uh, so in my, in my marriage, mm -hmm. uh, we lost a child three hours after birth. So here you go in with all of this expectation and the joy of having a new child and, and all that leads up to it for the nine months and getting things ready mm -hmm. and, you know, getting the room ready and yeah. redecorating and just all so much into that. Yeah. And then... Um, we went into the hospital early, about a week early, and they said there's something wrong. And so we're in the, in the room trying to figure out what is, what's happening. And we were there for hours waiting, what, what's, what's going on, what is the problem? Mm. And um, we ended up uh, delivering but then the child was uh, died three hours after the delivery. And so um, what stayed in my mind was the nurses allowed us to see the child as they're helping her breathe. They actually have a pump that's putting air into her. And just my extreme grief over the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the joy of looking forward to having a child yeah. and then suddenly everything goes wrong. And the after effect of that was difficult and different for both of us. Uh, so my wife at the time, obviously, you know, was, was just crushed. Yeah. I, I really had trouble getting in touch with just what happened, just the sorrow of the thing. And so communication was hard for me to express. I would just weep mm -hmm. and uh, just wondering how this, this went wrong. So that was a definite challenge in my life. Um, what that did beyond that is that I began to see that because of my experience, I could help encourage others who had gone through a similar situation. Out of my experience, I could try to encourage someone who faced a similar circumstance. Because you don't really understand what another person is going through or what he has gone through or they have gone through unless you've experienced it yourself. Yeah. I can talk about, I can talk and try to encourage an alcoholic. I've never been an alcohol, uh, you know, mm -hmm. an alcoholic. So I can't really relate to that. But losing a child, I can relate to any person on the planet who has lost a child. So you really had a lot of empathy for people that went through something, a similar experience. Absolutely. Such a tragedy. Yes. Yeah. And one thing I learned about grief, mm -hmm. and grief is different yeah. for everyone, but you really, it's personal, and you have to walk through it yourself. You get help, you know, you get strategies and so forth, 
But when it comes right down to it, you have to walk through it yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also where my faith came into play because I knew that I was not alone in trying to walk through this thing. That in, somehow in, in God's big picture of things, he's, help, he's going to help me navigate this, this very sorrowful time in my life. Mm -hmm. This is not the end. This I'm going to build on. And so this experience allows me then to speak to others who have gone through a similar experience and give them encouragement and give them hope. That's kind of how I've looked at my whole life. Yeah. All the difficulties that I've had in life, the stumbles, the tumbles, uh, mm -hmm. that I can use that experience and how I've processed it through my faith and still come up with hope and be able to give someone else yeah. encouragement. So from, from what I understand, you, you overcame some obstacles early on in life, right? So yes. Social obstacles? Right. So one of the messages that I really try to impress upon my clients and people around me is the idea of resiliency mm -hmm. and overcoming uh, obstacles are going to come our way. There's always going to be barriers in our way. We're always going to have problems to solve. We're always going to need to communicate with people to solve problems. There's always going to be frustrations in our way mm -hmm. and our goals are going to be challenged and to, to really try to work through it, give effort and overcome it. Sometimes it's a real struggle for people. And from what I understand with you, you had some early obstacles that you overcame when, when you were younger. I was scared to death to stand up in front of people and uh, to raise my hand in class. Uh, you would never see me raise my hand and when the teacher would call on me, I would like stammer a little bit. And mm -hmm. I always, always thought I was gonna say something stupid and uh, draw you know, ridicule or in the minds of the others around me would say, wow, that guy's really out of it, he has no clue. <laughs> And so that was with me all the way up until eighth grade. And then I was forced to take a speech course. I thought this is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to me. I'm gonna stand up in front of all my friends or these classmates, and I'm going to make a total fool out of myself, and I may pass out. I don't know what's gonna happen because I would be so nervous. Mm -hmm. And I remember, so in eighth grade, they forced it to take this speech course as part of the curriculum. And the first day that I was forced to get up and, and give a speech, I remember I was so nervous going in. And I got up in front of people and I could just sense that, oh man, they're watching me. My knees are knocking, my Adam's yeah. apples going yeah. up and down. I'm gasping for breath. So I make it through the like two and a half minute speech. It's not that long. And I sit down and I am so relieved. And then a minute later, I said, you dummy. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. And matter of fact, there was something inside that was triggered that I never even knew that was there. Uh, as, as I began to develop this, I realized I had a gift for, for speaking. And so I was in, they had me going in the other classrooms in the school giving presentations. Uh, doing bit parts on things. Um, I was in plays after that. I was doing all I could to develop this unknown talent or this gift that I had. And here's the point. Um, I never in a million years, even though I grew up thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to broadcast a football game or do the play-by-play? -play? I dreamed about that. I was a huge Bronco fan growing up because I grew up in, in Colorado. But there was no way I ever saw myself in a sports casting career. After eighth grade, things started to open up and I started to learn things about myself that walking through the fear allowed me to experience some things and realize, wait a minute, I can handle this or I'm actually good at this. And I was limiting myself by being so afraid of stepping out and trying to do it. So that has really served me all my life because I still run into the fear factor, you know, um, and particularly when I get up to speak, the adrenaline kicks in and there's a little fear. And I've learned that you walk through the first couple of minutes of the fear. And then when you settle down, the adrenaline actually really helps you. It helps focuses you and it helps you, um, it helps you make a difference with your life. So I look back on that, if I had lived in the fear, 
none of this would have been possible. Mm -hmm. I might have been working at Subway or I might, you know, which, which I'm not, I'm not downgrading Subway or, or working at, uh, yeah. at Star Market, yeah. but um, there was more intended for me. God had something yeah. else for me yeah. and it was only by addressing and walking through the fear and actually taking that step mm -hmm. when you feel like everything says run, yeah. but you walk into it and then after a couple of minutes, you realize, man, I'm actually pretty good at this, or I can do this. And that God had put something inside of me that needed to be used, but I didn't know how to use it. It took my eighth grade speech teacher and my high school speech teacher to recognize there's a gift inside this guy that they pushed me. My high school speech teacher was pretty hard on me because he knew what I had. So he pushed me to excel. He knew what you were capable of. He knew of. what I was capable of, yeah. and that made all the difference. So my, my, yeah. um, the sad part is that people who have a gift, and we all have something to share. Sure. God's put something yeah. inside of all of us, but if we don't use it, or we don't push ourselves to explore it, or to get it out, or the people that never have someone come up and say, hey, you know what, you have something I see in you. And that, I think, is one of the values of my Christian faith. We're supposed to be bringing out the best in other people. Look, you have a gift. God has given you something special. Use it. That will bring you satisfaction. That will bring you the joy in your life that maybe you're looking for. Once you get in line with what God, how God has created you, then you start to feel like, okay, I, I fit in this world. There, there's, there's a purpose for my life. And I think that's the one thing that, that the faith gives me, my faith. I have purpose. Mm -hmm. I know why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to encourage other people. That's my, that's my gift. Other people have other gifts and things to share, but mine is, if I can bring out the best in you, if I can encourage you, that encourages me. You have encouraged me to read The, the Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and, yeah. and his first line is, it's not about you. Don't you love that? Because <laughs> what does our society say? It's all about me, yeah, sure. <laughs> isn't it? You know, and I, I grew up in the 60s yeah. when everything was like uh, taking back the, the power in our lives and doing your own thing and uh, authority, forget about authority. I want to live the way I want to live. I mean, that was all what it was. When, when you realize that purpose-driven life first line, it's not about you, and it becomes about others, life opens up. Pretty soon, your attitudes, uh, the way you live your life is open to other people feeding into it. And so, uh, God really gave us two rules. You know, you heard the Ten Commandments and all of these things. He, when Jesus was asked, all right, uh, what are the two most important commandments? He said, there are two. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as yourself. Well, that's, that's not that hard, but then that is really hard. So he's saying, God has a design on your life. God really put something inside of you that nobody else in the universe has got. You've got something special, and your job is to, to use it. And then he said, love others as yourself. Well, you think, wow, that's a mind blower, right? So I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I'm supposed to love people in other countries that are you know, not operating with Christian values and so forth. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, there's a lot packed in there, but love God, love others seems to, what kind of a world would we have if we actually had that happen? What can you offer people who might not know what they have to offer you know, wh what kind of guidance can you, can you give people who are, are trying to find out what their gift is yeah. and, and are, you know, on that journey to finding, finding that part? What do you enjoy? What is the thing that kind of flips the switch in you? Or what are you even attracted to? And the developing that gift means intentional. Be, be intentional about it. You see something that you're interested in, Pursue it, you know, seek it and pursue it sure. and develop it. That's, that's the thing. I think there are a lot of us kind of have an idea of what we're excited about or what we're into or might be sports. It was sports for me. 
and I couldn't play sports because I had a curvature spine. Uh, when I was growing up, I couldn't play. So what did I do? I became a trainer. And uh, a trainer works in the training room and works on the sideline, tapes up ankles and knees, works with injuries. And um, we had a University of Colorado trainer come down into our high school training room. And he was kind of instructing me. And, and uh, I ended up going to the University of Colorado on a training scholarship, working with the athletes. I had a curvature spine. I couldn't play anything, but I could be a part of sports by working in the training room, being on the sidelines. And I also officiated. I did football, basketball, and umpired baseball. Did it on the high school level and did semi-pro baseball. Again, developing what I, I couldn't play, but I could be a part of the sports by finding other avenues and other ways to do it. And broadcasting kind of led into that also. There is, as I look back on my life, Jay, there was a kind of right place at right time. And this, again, is how I see God in my life. At the right time, something was revealed to me, and I seized it. I, I worked at it. I, I jumped on it. Um, I don't know how many I've missed along the way, but the important pressure points I seem to be aware of. So I got my first radio job. That changed everything. So I did five years of radio when I was in college. I did the high school football, basketball, and baseball play-by-play. -play. I did a sports show, disc jockey shows. It was, you did everything. Mm -hmm. So it was really a learning experience. So I seized that opportunity. Then I got a job doing weekend sports in Denver at a TV station. That changed my life. I realized, wait a minute, I might have a career here doing something I love to do on television. I never thought I would get out of radio, but then taking the step there, then I went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Then I came to Providence the first time and I worked at Channel 10 for two and a half years. Then I went to Milwaukee for three years as a PM Magazine co-host. It was a half hour magazine show on television. Then I came back to Channel 6 here and worked for 35 years before I retired. And then still do some shooting of high school sports and some other shows uh, that's kind of keeping the interest, uh, you know, my, yeah, my, yeah. My, my, my passion alive there. But the whole thing is, Seize the opportunity. Um, you know, if you're given something, take hold of it and make it work for you. And work is the key. You don't passively enter into something that you have a passion about. Mm -hmm. You jump into it. Mm -hmm. You make it happen. You develop it. Um, a gift is meant to be developed. First of all, a gift is meant to be used and it's meant to be developed. So if you don't do those two things, the gift will dry up. You know, I sit here and I listen to you talk about your experiences and I'm struck by uh, how much perseverance and stick to itness you have had and have, and also allowing yourself to be part of opportunities. And so mm. what message do you have for, because I, I, I come across a lot of people that will not approach opportunities, will not even entertain opportunities because of fear of messing up or not being good enough or good at it. What message do you have for, for people to, to, you know, put their foot in the door? I am a prime example of that because I was fearful from, from the day I was born. And unless <clears throat> you step out and walk through the fear, you're not going to achieve anything. You have to put yourself in a position for success. And I, um, I failed. I failed on things. I failed in covering some things. Uh, sometimes I wasn't totally prepared the way I should have been, but each one was a learning experience. The whole thing about broadcasting, you're only on, on the air for a TV sportscast for about three and a half minutes, maybe four. Well, why am I there for eight hours of the day or 10 hours or sure. whatever? Everything yeah. is about preparation. preparation. You've got to be yes. prepared so that those three and a half or four minutes yeah. hum. Yeah. If you're not prepared, the audience knows you're not going to have your job very long. So it's really all about preparation. Yeah. Uh, when you're going to school, you're preparing for something. If you don't prepare for your test, what are the results? If you don't prepare for life after school, if you don't go to school or care about school, what's life after school going to look like? Everything yeah. is used for preparation. Yeah. 
when you prepare yourself well, you can experience the most that life has to offer for, for uh, to offer you. If you don't, what are you expecting? And I, I get down to that word expectation. If I don't put the time in something, if I don't really dedicate myself to something, what am I expecting? Um, how can I expect great success or great joy unless I put something into the effort? A little bit earlier, you talked about discomfort and um, you know, really exposing yourself to the very thing that you're fearful of. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people that I work with in my practice really run away from discomfort and don't like their body, you know, maybe their heart's beating a little bit or, you know, they, they get tense or they get hot, some sort of symptom that prevents them from doing what you said and that's kind of working through that. Mm -hmm. How, what kind of guidance can you give people that, uh, you know, yes, you know, there's some discomfort there, but, but this, is, this is what you can do to push through. The reward on the other end. I'm never going to get to where I want to go. I'm never going to get the reward unless I push through that very fear, the thing that's restricting my life. If I let the fear win, where am I? What am I doing with myself? Where am I going to end up in 10 years or 20 years or whatever? If I fight through the fear, I explore myself. I find things out about myself. I find that I have resilience. I find that I can fight through the difficult thing. I can overcome the difficult thing. So the next time I'm standing at the Super Bowl doing a live shot back to Providence, knowing that you have thousands of people watching you, yes. I have the confidence to say, I am scared to death, but I've done this before. Yes. And I'm going to do well now because I have the experience to do it. Okay. As you build your experience level, that gives you the confidence the next time something comes up that you're able to handle it. If you run away from that, you never have a chance to build your confidence. You're living out of the deficit instead of living out of the overflow. We want to be living out of the overflow. And that's by pouring yourself into the talent that you have or whatever the job is or, or your family, whatever it is that, that will bring the, uh, the kind of um, joy that you're looking for, that's where you want to be. You don't want to be living in the deficit of things where you're always settling for second best. I'm kind of a security guy. I like things that are kind of, you know, well planned out and yeah. like on a sol solid foundation. So every change does bring some anxiety with me. When I, uh, so I, I was in Denver for two years doing weekends, Cedar Rapids, Iowa for 13 months as a sportscaster there, came to Providence for two and a half years, went to Milwaukee for three and then back for mm -hmm. the 35 at Channel 6. And so each one of those moves, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I, I can't move. I, mm -hmm. I'm really happy here. I need to be here. Mm -hmm. The idea of the move was just causing huge anxiety with me. Mm -hmm. And yet when I made the move mm -hmm. and actually came, my career grew, my uh, personal growth, you know, started yeah. to develop. Uh, I got married, I found, uh, found a wife in Milwaukee. It's like if I had limited myself to Colorado, which I love Colorado and I mm -hmm. had always thought I'll be there for, for my entire yeah, life, forever, I yeah. would have missed out on all of this yeah. that I've learned since that time. Yeah. Different places, different people, now friends all over the country, mm -hmm. that the value of expanding yourself mm -hmm. and growing um, is just so obvious to me now after thinking about living in one place and doing one thing all my life, mm. being forced out of the bubble, being forced to grow, forced to find new friends, mm. forced to rely on myself. Because mm -hmm. every time you go into a new place, you're by yourself for, you know, a good five or six months until you find some friends that you can hang with or whatever. Mm. So it allowed me and I really used those opportunities to develop myself. I did a lot of introspective reading, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with, with, mm -hmm. the, with the scriptures, uh, with books. Um, I was very lonely when I go into these places and sometimes the loneliness was overwhelming. But each time I was able to build on that, understand it, and then 
The next time I moved, okay, this is where I'm at. I understand this is where I, I am now, but I'm not gonna stay there mm. as I meet friends and so forth. So I, I actually appreciated the time of being alone and of the stress of that and of, um, it, it, it created a, a growth spurt. If I can handle that, I can handle anything now. Sure. So the next time I move, I understood that and I was much, much more aware, much uh, better equipped to develop a life in the next place because I've survived. I remember moving out of, out of Boulder, Colorado, which is heaven to me. Um, you have the mountains there, I love to hike, it was winter sports, it was all of that. And I go to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in the cornfields. And I'm going, and the winters are brutal, and I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> I was really alone. But you know what, when you get into that mm -hmm. alone space, and you really come to grips with it, I did a lot of reading. It took me some time to develop some friendships, and the church was helpful in that, in that regard. And that's one thing, every time I've gone to a new place, immediately found a church, mm. and the relationships develop much easier in a church, because people are looking to serve each other. That's the whole point of the, of the thing. But I remember in those uh, months of being uh, alone a lot, I discovered things about myself. I was able to say, I can survive this, I can rely on myself. I can develop myself in ways that when you're always with somebody or you're always at a party or whatever, yeah. that, that you don't. You kind of stunt your growth in some of these areas. Here I had a chance to go inside. While I still had a very public appearance on a television station, I was able to develop the inner part of me about and, and character. Who am I? Yeah. What am I? Who do I want to be? How am I going to get there? It sounds like you gave yourself a lot of time to be introspective I did. about yeah. who you are and where you want to go with it. When I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the first job out of Colorado, I journaled. I just wrote, wrote uh, a lot of things on a tablet and my, my deepest feelings and, yeah. and fears and all of that. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have a lot of things uh, that you also do today. and. Uh, one of them is you meet with inmates at, at a prison. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences? For the last 20 years, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what am I really doing to make this world a better place? And that, that really hit me when I was in my 20s. Like, I'm living for myself. What am I doing? To, how can I affect the world? And um, I started to sponsor a child through um, child fund, some, some child in Mexico. And so I've seen over the years, she's now 16 years old, I, I think I had her when, and she's like the third child I had, but I, I decided in college that unless I'm doing something to address the needs of the, the problems of the world, what, I'm, who am I? What am I doing? Am I just spinning my wheels here? And so I can't save the world, but I can make a difference with that one person. And so when I um, had the opportunity, we had some, somebody who was in our church whose husband was in prison. And that's the first time I went in to meet with him. And then I thought, wait a minute. If encouragement is my gift, I can use encouragement in the prison with somebody who's kind of at the end of the, their rope. And so uh, the chaplain then said, how would you like to preach in the prison? And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, I can't really relate to what these lives are like, what they've gone through. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's out of my experience level. And he said, can you preach hope? And I said, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I went in and I would talk to these guys, sports, everybody loves sports, and it's, uh, you're talking to men who've grown up with sports. So I, I would always use sports analogies and sports would always be the entrance into talking about faith and something deeper in their lives. Because, okay, we wanna get them out of the prison, who are they gonna be then? The residual, people going back to prison is very high. Yeah. So what will keep them out? You know, and uh, oftentimes they get out, they have no place to go, they go back to the old neighborhood, they go back to the old problems 
and they go back to the old decisions. How can we change their decision-making process mm. saying that they matter to God? They, ma they were created with a purpose. They were, uh, you know, Psalm says uh, you were uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. So how can we tell them that God has a plan for your life? You don't have to live in, you know, in the pain that you're living in that brought you in here. There's a different way to live. I think one of the problems, Jay, is that a lot of people don't understand there is a different, there's a higher level than where they're living. They've never experienced it. So they, don't know, they don't know how to get there. They don't even know if, it's, if there is something there. Um, once you've experienced blessing, once you've experienced joy, once you've experienced that, you know, things that, um, that lift you instead of drag you down, then you start to say, oh, okay, the world is really something more than I'm making of it. There is more, there is hope, there is joy. And so you begin pursuing those things instead of pursuing just having your needs met or you know, the next relationship or sex or whatever it is. I, so here's, here's um, kind of my, my point. I think God created all of us with a hole inside of ourselves. And we try all of our lives to fill that hole with different things. We fill it with cars, we fill it with, uh, it might be sex, uh, you know, it, it might be prestige, uh, you know, big job, money, whatever it is. We keep pouring that stuff right in that hole and it just keeps going through. Because there's only one thing that was really meant for that hole. If you are a creation of God, He knows exactly what's necessary to bring you you know, satisfaction and joy. So when we find God and we put God in that hole, suddenly He fills that hole and we don't have to have all of these other relationships jumping from one relationship to another. We don't have to have the, you know, the, the big job, the money, you keep going from job to job, whatever it is, we don't have to keep trying to fill that hole. God's in the hole. All of these things around us become blessings. Mm. So we're not desperate to get these other things that are trying to find the satisfaction that I feel only God can give us. Mm. Once He's in the right place in our lives, all these things become blessings. Now, everything is not going to feel like I'm totally put together, totally satisfied or whatever while I'm on this earth. Because there's always this, if you're feeling a restlessness or you're feeling like I don't quite fit, that's, God created us that way. We're never going to be totally at peace until we're at one with Him, which I feel is heaven, making the decisions that, but He's, he's the factor inside of us that is our only really avenue to total peace. Mm -hmm. And again, we can't really experience that here, uh, but we can get close to it. You know, you talk about blessings and you know, for, for people that don't know, you are my father-in-law, and... Uh, and I'm happy you, about that, because <laughs> I'm glad you're my son-in-law. Thank you. Uh. And you have helped me with understanding what my blessings are, mm -hmm. and um, especially when we do prayer before we eat, mm -hmm. and um, you've helped me... understand what's important mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Don't you think that a lot of people keep living their lives for the next step or that the, the, the satisfaction uh, is just not there and so they're yeah. always looking for something else? Yeah. And I think once we look inside of ourselves and said, say that, look, I have purpose, I have value, not because of who I am, but because of who I belong to. Yeah. God created you yeah. with purpose and value. And when you extend that to your family, and even in the brokenness, Jay, God just, he, he understands brokenness, but He doesn't leave us broken. Mm -hmm. He provides the vehicles, He provides the resources, He provides the inspiration to make something out of the brokenness, to make something beautiful. Um, we were all 
it really goes back to a basic understanding. If you're created in the image of the creator, you have incredible value. And who knows how to fix the creation more than the creator? So if you have issues, if you have problems or whatever, if you're a, if you're a car and you're not running right, you go to a mechanic, right? Go on. If you have uh, health issues, you go to a doctor. I think that if you want to know about yourself and how you were constructed, you go to the Creator. Have you thought about this? Look at the, look at the value of the human body. Who could think of a heart and a brain that could, you know, process things and legs and you know for for the athlete and the arms and and all of the. Uh, you know, just the way the body is constructed. And I'm learning more and more about that as I get older too. <laughs> some of the, uh, you know, some of the things are uh, not as sharp as they used to be or whatever. Yeah. But just think of the, of the incredible human body yeah. and all that goes into it, the blood flow, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the kidneys, everything has a function. And uh, who could design that? God cr created us in his image. So what he has for us is, is beautiful, is incredible. In my practice, uh, you know, we talk a lot about mindfulness and being present. And I, I think to, to, to add to what you're talking about, being uh, grateful mm. for what you do have as opposed to what you don't have or what you're longing for. And you were talking a lot about those yeah. the void that people will try to fill it with stuff, mm -hmm. not really meaningful things. Right. Where, you know, if we place more of an emphasis on our relationships and the people who are in front of us and loving them mm -hmm. uh, as much as we can and appreciating them. And you've also taught me about grace. And to me, what you've helped me with is grace for people who may be, might be nasty to you yeah. or might just be rude or uh, you know, to, to appreciate that they're hurting and mm -hmm. to not take it personal. So I've learned to have much, I could definitely say I did not have that when I was younger, did not have <laughs> grace. We uh, all grow. Yeah. I, that's great <laughs> sure. to hear. I really yeah. am thrilled to hear yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I, I preached recently at my church um, and I preached on loving kindness, and um, I had a I had a situation that. So you always wonder, okay, if I'm going to talk to people about you, Lord, what do you want me to say? And I was in the grocery store, and I was sitting there with my items, and the woman in front of me was putting her items in a bag, and then I noticed that the cashier was really irritated. And this woman, this older woman, is saying something to her that I can't hear, but obviously the exchange is not yeah, going not well. Good. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm next. I've got to walk up <laughs> and deal with this cashier who's not going to be in a very good mood. No. And so being who I am, I said a quick prayer and said, Lord, give me the words. You know, how can, what can I say? So I said uh, to her, I said, ah, it looks like it's already been a kind of a challenging morning, hasn't it? And she said, you can't believe it. Then she went off again, but fortunately yeah. she was wearing the mask so I couldn't hear anything that she was <laughs> saying, which uh, was one Dodged of the few the times I was happy that we were wearing masks. <laughs> but at the end of that, I said, you know, thank you for the patience you're showing with the customers because I'm sure this is a difficult job. Mm. You know what, she calmed right down. Mm. She started to give me an exchange. And as I walked off, I said, God bless you, have a good day. And I think under that mask, I saw a smile. That was at nine in the morning. So I mm -hmm. had just changed the day for hundreds of other customers mm -hmm. going through there mm -hmm. over the next four or five hours. But what did it take from me? It took one word of kindness. It took just recognizing where she was at and not being you know, confrontational because uh, oftentimes when you get into a situation where someone is irritated, you get irritated back, right? right. Instead, offer a word of kindness mm -hmm. and that just changed the, the whole thing. 
So I'm, I'm thinking, what is the value of kindness? Well, first of all, kindness comes from God. He's kind toward us and he expects us to be kind toward others. But kindness will diffuse, you know, high emotions. It'll, it'll diffuse confrontation. Being kind to someone is accepted as somebody caring about me or you know, the Bible in one uh, version says loving kindness, God's loving kindness toward us. When we offer loving kindness to somebody else, what's the response? Mm -hmm. Kindness. So um, that word really mm -hmm. struck me because I thought, what are the things that I do during my day that if I just show a little more kindness in the way I responded to somebody, if the way I thought about somebody, if a note that I wrote somebody, if the person in the car in front of me, you know, was irritating me, if I showed kindness there, if I showed kindness by stopping, allowing somebody to walk, you know, East Greenwich, you know, uh, you can, they have a few crosswalks, but a lot of people, you know, walk, walk in between the cross. If I just stop, isn't that an act of kindness? So if we had more kindness, I think we could, uh, I think, so my point during the sermon was, how do we deal with the pandemic and how do we deal with the new year? Kindness. Kindness toward another person will help change our culture. You are a deacon at Christ Church in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, and I know you're part of a lot of programs there. and You offer a lot of services to the community. Can you, can you go into a little bit about what you provide? When somebody comes in and uh, they meet with us, we sit and talk with them about what is your life story? Tell us what's happened. How did you get here? Uh, housing is a big issue right now uh, because housing in Rhode Island is difficult because there's, it's scarce. And then affordable housing is even worse. So subsidized housing, some of the, uh, some of the waiting lists are six years, oh, wow. seven years. Wow. So you have people who are desperate now that have no place to, to go. So they're, they're oftentimes renting uh, one of these rundown hotel rooms or something like that just to get by, hoping to, to make it. So we offer uh, some help trying to find them better housing. We offer them some support, encouragement. Uh, we pray with them. We offer them gift cards to Stop and Shop and Walmart just for some of the, um, some of the items. And then we offer them a coach, someone to walk with them to help them navigate the rough waters that they're in, to, to help encourage them along the way and help them to make better decisions oftentimes in the ways that they've gone because they've oftentimes settled for something second best. And that is, uh, you know, maybe living with someone instead of making a commitment yeah. to them. And then they get a little ways down the line and that person takes off on them and they're left holding the bag and so they don't, uh, they can't afford their rent. Uh, it's like just coming to grips with how do I set myself up to where I get the support I need and make the right decisions that will help improve my life instead of uh, mm -hmm. hurt my life. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we, where we are. Mm -hmm. And my joy comes in just encouraging somebody who walks in the door, somebody who is, I would say, beaten down by life, you know, facing difficult situations. They walk out with a little of the burden lifted off their shoulders. They walk out with a smile instead of the frown that they walked in on. Yeah. That's the difference you can make. You can't change their whole life. That's really their decision. That's what they've got to pursue. But for this moment that they're in my presence, that I'm working with them, I can encourage them and uh, give them something of value to their life, mm -hmm. that they are worth something. I can't thank you enough. I, I appreciate everything that you do for me, my family, the community. I want to thank you for the time that you took today. And I really hope in the, in the future we get to do this again and maybe some new initiatives uh, because I think your messages are so important for so many people to hear. Thank you. So. I, I, would, I would just end with Jim Valvano. You know, most, a lot of my encouragement comes from, uh, from the sports world. But when Jim Valvano was standing up at the ESPYs and 
you know, essentially would be gone in, in just a short time with cancer. And he just said, don't give up. Don't ever give up. And that's really the call. Mm. Don't give up. Don't settle for second best. Don't, don't allow yourself to cave. You know, keep, you know, courage allows us to overcome some obstacles. You know, call on courage. Uh, call, on, call on a higher power, whatever it is for you. Don't give up because nothing great is ever accomplished by giving up. If you just fight through the fear, if you, if you just keep at it, the world starts to open up and you start to realize you're doing some things that you never thought were possible. Thank you again, Ken. I always leave our conversations inspired to be kinder and show more grace to others. Please share your comments and questions in the section below, and I hope to have Ken back on the channel in the not too distant future for further initiatives that will be taking place. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and pass this along to those you believe it may help. Thank you for watching, and as always, be where you are, be resilient.